Hello and welcome back to Biology for Beginners. Last time we tackled cellular respiration, this week we're going to be jumping into chapter 7 and talking all about photosynthesis. So buckle up and let's get into it. As always, before we jump into the meat and potatoes of this whole section, right now you can see the terms and definition slides kind of popping up and you are free to pause the video and grab them so that you can have the vocabulary we will be using today. Also, I would like to reiterate that if you would like the entire PDF of my slides to follow along or use as a study guide, these terms and definitions are in that PDF. And if you just follow the link over to my Patreon, you can grab that PDF for absolutely free. However, if you are a patron, you do get access to Bio for Beginners and this PDF a day early, give or take a few hours. Before we move on, I would like to note that the last two terms and definitions we have on here are the greenhouse effect and climate change. The very last section in the book does talk about gr the greenhouse effect and climate change. However, I'm not really gonna talk about it here in this video because this is already gonna be a fairly long presentation on photosynthesis. And in a general entry level biology class, while you will talk about the greenhouse effect and climate change, probably it wouldn't necessarily be right now. And that subject could be an entire video on its own. And I am doing a little mini series every now and then when I feel like it, specifically on climate change. So more likely than not, we will be talking about this particular subject in one of those videos. So without further ado, let's get into it. Before we really get into the nitty gritty of the process of photosynthesis, we need to talk about the who of photosynthesis. And the organisms that are able to photosynthesize are autotrophs, specifically photoautotrophs. Now, autotroph is just a big word that basically means an organism that's able to make their own food. And not make their own food in the way that you or I might cook ourselves lunch or breakfast, but make their own food from these inorganic molecules and convert some form of energy into the chemical energy that we need for life. And the photoautotroph part means that these organisms use the solar light energy as their means of the energy source for the conversion to the chemical energy for life. And specifically, we're talking about photoautotrophs with photosynthesis because there is another type of autotroph that we will not be discussing today, the chemosynthesizers that use chemosynthesis, which basically just means they use energy from another chemical source instead. A lot of these organisms you can find around like the deep sea thermal vents and things like that. And they are cool little organisms that we're not gonna mention again for the rest of this video. So the autotrophs that we're talking about are the organisms like the plants that I'm sure many people are already fairly familiar with. I don't think anyone's ever not seen a plant, but they are the heavy hitters of photosynthesis that we are familiar with. We also have organisms like giant kelp, which represent the algal species. It's important to remember that seaweeds and kelps are algae, they are not plants. I have a whole video that I will link in the description if I remember about the difference between plants and algae. But another organism we have that a lot of people don't realize are the little bacteria known as cyanobacteria. They are these little microscopic photosynthesizers that kind of kicked off the eukaryotic photosynthesizing life. And they are the organisms that are thought to be responsible for the oxygen content as we know it in the modern earth because the ancient prehistoric earth prior to all this photosynthesis had a lot less oxygen. So we have to thank the cyanobacteria for us even being able to be here and use all the oxygen that they began to produce. So we have these autotrophs 
And it's important to remember that everyone else, every other organism that does not make their own food are the heterotrophs. So they're the things that consume other things. And we just have a bunch of examples here from the herbivores like my lovely horse to the obligate carnivores like the lovely red-tailed boa we have here and also the other microscopic organisms like the blepharisma and other little um, paramecians and other organisms that do not photosynthesize. They are all heterotrophs. They need to consume other things in order to get that energy to be able to produce more of the molecules that they need to produce and go about their day and live life. So where exactly does photosynthesis happen? Now, for the purposes of this video, we're gonna focus on where photosynthesis happens in plants, not necessarily in the algae and the bacteria, but the overall photosynthetic process is going to be largely similar no matter what organism we're talking about. But again, we're talking about plants here since in an entry level biology class, that is what's gonna be focused on the photosynthesis that happens in plants. So in plants, it's going to largely happen in the leaves, specifically in the mesophyll cells of the leaves. And mesophyll is just a very specific kind of ground tissue type that you're going to find in plants. Plants are weird, but they also have their own specific tissues and organ systems, just like animals do, but a little bit different because they do things a little bit differently since they're plants. And within those mesophyll cells, you're gonna find the little organelle, the chloroplast. And the chloroplast is the little thing that makes the photosynthesis happen. But remember that plants are weird and there may be exceptions to some rules. I do know that there are other plants that have different photosynthetic tissues and you'll see photosynthesis happening, not just in leaves, but we're not getting into the nuances of that today. For our purposes, photosynthesis happens in the chloroplasts, in the mesophyll cells, in leaves. Now, if we zoom in this diagram that we just saw on the last side a little bit, just the chloroplast part, you'll notice that it has all of these little green stacks inside of them. Well, each little disc of those stacks is one thylakoid. And when you get the thylakoid stacked up, those are gonna be the grana. And around all of these stacks of thylakoids, around all those grana, we'll have a very thick fluid known as the stroma. Now the thylakoid and the stroma is very important for photosynthesis. That is where the different parts of the process are going to happen. But the thing that they don't really have labeled on this diagram is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the main pigment that is gonna capture the light that provides the energy to be converted from that solar energy into the chemical energy for life. But we also need to remember that carbon dioxide is important because that is where the carbon comes from. So how exactly does the CO2 get in for the photosynthesis to happen? Well, that is pretty easy because if we zoom out to kind of the schematic of the leaf here or the cross section of the leaf, we'll see what I have circled in pink are these little pores, which are known as the stomata, or individually one is going to be called a stoma. But generally, if we're gonna be talking about it, we're gonna be talking about more than one, so stomata is the plural. And what the stomata are, are these little openings in the leaf that allow for the gas exchange. So it allows for the carbon dioxide to go into the leaf and the oxygen and also water vapor to come out because how plants move water through their leaf or through the entire body of the plant is essentially evaporation through these stomata. So the plant is able to regulate the opening and closing of the stomata using the two specialized cells known as guard cells. 
And they basically work with the opening and closing with the diffusion of water into and out of the cell. So when water diffuses in, the cell becomes turgid and it opens. When water diffuses out of the cell, it becomes flaccid and the stomata are closed. So water in, stomata open, water out, stomata close. And when the stomata open, like I mentioned before, carbon dioxide is able to get into the leaf and oxygen and water are able to diffuse out. And that's basically just done along their concentration gradients. It's just gonna be simple diffusion in and out. Now, it's important to note that when we have very hot and dry conditions, plants will close those stomata to conserve water. And we will talk a little bit more about the challenges that presents a little bit later in this video. Photosynthesis happens in two stages. So we have the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. Now, some older textbooks and in some classes, the Calvin cycle will be referred to as the dark reactions. But in the biology and botany worlds, we're moving away from that terminology because it's inaccurate. The Calvin cycle runs in the light too. However, the light reactions are fairly accurate because that is how the light energy is captured. So a quick little overview before we really get into the nitty gritty of this is that the light reactions happen in those thylakoids, in the thylakoid membrane specifically. And that's where the light energy is harvested. And then the Calvin cycle happens in the stroma. So that thick kind of jelly-like fluid is where the Calvin cycle happens and that is where the carbon is fixed and that is where the big product and overall payout of photosynthesis happens in the form of sugars. Let's get into the light reactions. So light is an electromagnetic energy and it travels in waves. These waves are going to be measured in things known as wavelengths. And this electromagnetic spectrum that you can see on the slide here shows the full range of those electromagnetic wavelengths. And kind of pulled out here, we can see the very narrow range of visible light, which is gonna be from about 380 nanometers to about 750 nanometers. Um, we say about because those aren't necessarily hard cutoffs but it is around there. And it's important to recognize that these little things called photons are the little particles that have fixed quantities of energy. Now it's all a little bit more complicated than that, but this is not a physics lesson. This is essentially what you need to understand to have an idea of how photosynthesis works. So again, we're gonna be focusing on this visible light spectrum and the other thing to remember about that photon energy thing is that the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. The longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's how the math works out. And because this is not a physics class, we don't have to get into those big scary physics equations. So just remember, shorter wavelength, higher energy, longer wavelength, lower energy, 380 to about 750 is the range we're looking at here. And so as we get into it, the pigments, so like chlorophyll, are the things that absorb light and they're going to be embedded in the thylakoid membrane. The big heavy hitter of photosynthesis is known as chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A mainly absorbs the blue, violet, and red lights. So the best range for that photosynthesis, you're kind of hitting that kind of very high energy and a little bit of the low energy range, but that leaves a lot of the spectrum unaccounted for, a lot of light energy to still be harvested. So we have chlorophyll B, which is very similar in structure to chlorophyll A, but it absorbs the blue and orange lights. And then we also have other pigments like carotenoids that 
will function to expand the light that's usable for photosynthesis, but it also helps protect chlorophyll from damage, especially from the very high energy wavelengths. But at this point, you might be thinking, well, if chlorophyll is absorbing blue, violet, and red, or the blue and orange light, why are plants green? Well, what we see is not what the pigment absorbs. What we see is the light that is bounced back. And largely in plants, um, the absorbed light is going to be everything other than green. So the light that's bounced back that we see is actually the green light. So just remember, you see what is not absorbed. How exactly is this light energy absorbed, you may be asking now. Well, we see that pigments absorb the light, but what exactly is happening here? Well, we have these things called photosystems, specifically two photosystems, photosystem one and photosystem two. And the similarities in these photosystems is that they have what are known as antenna complexes. And the antenna complex is basically a thing full of pigments that are going to harvest the light energy. And they have a reaction center complex. And in this reaction center complex, you're going to have a special pair of chlorophyll A pigments, specifically photosystem one and photosystem two, the chlorophyll A's within them will specialize in a very specific wavelength of light. Now, that's not really necessary to know for a very entry level biology class, but that is something that you would need to recognize if you went into like a botany class. And that is a big difference in these two photosystems. But in this reaction center complex, besides the special chlorophyll A pair we have, we also have what's known as the primary electron receptor. And that is an important thing because the way that this kind of works is that when the photon of light hits that chlorophyll molecule, the electron gets really excited and jumps up into a really high energy state where it can be accepted by that primary electron acceptor and moved down an electron transport chain. And then eventually things will come back to the ground state. You'll lose some energy as heat. You'll lose energy again as fluorescence. So photons will fluoresce and then everything will come back to the ground state. And that is it in very simple terms. Again, if you take a more advanced like botany class that you get into the nitty gritty of photosynthesis, they'll talk a little more in depth about that whole process. But it is important to note that these two photosystems do work together. So let's talk a little bit about the two photosystems. So in this first kind of diagram that we're seeing here that represents the photosystems as kind of construction workers moving the electron along. Photosystem two is the first photosystem that we come in contact with. Photosystem one is going to be the second one. Their names are kind of confusing because they're named in the order that they were discovered, not in the order that they happen. But the main thing that you're seeing here is that photons will hit photosystem two, electrons will become excited, jump up to the top, go down that electron transport chain, ATP will be produced, electrons will end up in photosystem one, photons can hit photosystem one, they will be excited, and then NADP plus can accept those electrons, become NADPH, and move on. So where we're going to really discuss this, a little more in-depth diagram that is from the book that kind of visualizes everything in the way it would be on the thylakoid membrane, we can see here. So photosystem two, remember photosystem two is the first photosystem in the process. It was discovered second, but happens first. So photosystem two, it's going to collect light, and this is where the water is going to be split. And when the water molecules are split, we get the production of oxygen and these hydrogen ions. 
And so this is where the oxygen waste product comes for photosynthesis. Remember, photosynthesis O2 is a waste product. It is pretty much the exact opposite of cellular respiration. And so photosystem two is what's responsible for that particular waste product. And then the electron transport chain will carry the electrons to photosystem one. And photosystem one also collects light. Remember, photosystem one still has an antenna complex and photosystem one is still collecting a very specific wavelength of light. And then this is where the NADP plus and the hydrogen plus and all those electrons can end up as the NADPH, which is just an electron carrier that will then go to the Calvin cycle. And then with all these hydrogen ions still kind of floating around in that thylakoid space, which is gonna have that very high H plus concentration, the stroma on the outside has a relatively low H plus concentration. So we see ATP synthase again. Remember, we talked about ATP synthase in cellular respiration. Well, we also see that here in the thylakoid membrane because ATP will be produced as the H plus ions move down their gradient through ATP synthase and generate the production of ATP that will specifically go to the Calvin cycle. So that NADPH and the ATP that is produced through those photosystems then is moved over into the stroma to the Calvin cycle. And the kind of overview of what happens during the Calvin cycle is that a enzyme known as Rubisco attaches to carbon dioxide and joins RUBP, which is just a five carbon sugar, which results in two three carbon molecules. So when carbon dioxide is originally attached to this sugar, it's a very unstable six carbon molecule. So it's only in that form for a very brief period of time and it breaks down into the two three carbon molecules. And so in step two, we get ATP and NADPH being used to reduce that three carbon molecule into G3P, which is just another three carbon molecule. And so one of the GP3 molecules, because we end up with two at the end of this, since we had that six carbon molecule that split into two. So two G3P molecules. One of them will leave the cycle to become the product, which is going to be glucose that can be then moved into other sugars and other products. And then the other one goes so that RUBP can be regenerated and the process will start again. So it was a fairly short process, fairly quick and to the point, but the main point here is that Rubisco will fix the carbon and carbon dioxide and fixing just means that it catches it so it can be transformed into a sugar. And it's a cycle that kind of continues going. While the Calvin cycle is a fairly simple and efficient process, there is a problem specifically with that main enzyme Rubisco. And that problem is known as photorespiration. So what exactly is photorespiration? Well, photorespiration happens when Rubisco attaches to O2 instead of CO2. And because it attached to O2, that oxygen is then attached to the RUBP and then carbon dioxide, instead of being used, is produced as a product and energy is wasted. And so it's called photorespiration because it happens during this light, during the overall photosynthesis process and its respiration because oxygen is converted into carbon dioxide instead of the other way around. But when exactly does this happen? Well, it happens when the oxygen builds up in the leaf, which then means there's more oxygen around and rubisco is more likely to attach to the oxygen than it is to the carbon dioxide.
and this happens a lot in the hot, dry conditions. Remember that plants will close their stomata when there's hot, dry conditions to conserve water. Well, when that happens, oxygen can't get back out of the leaf and carbon dioxide cannot get in. And since oxygen is a waste product of photosynthesis, it begins to start building up. So how exactly do plants deal with this problem? Well, to do that, we're gonna have to talk about the three types of plants, C3, C4, and CAM plants. And the three types is basically referring to how their photosynthesis happens and how this problem is dealt with. First, let's talk about the C3 plants. C3 plants are going to be the most abundant of all these plants. The example here we have is a rice plant and many of the plants used for agriculture are going to be C3 plants. So they're called C3 plants because the first stable product of carbon fixation is a three carbon molecule. So in that very basic Calvin cycle that we just looked at, notice the first stable product once the CO2 was added to the RUBP was a three carbon molecule. And so since that is the first product of carbon fixation, these plants are known as C3, which basically just refers to those three carbons. And so these plants will close their stomata in the very hot, dry conditions. It, it conserves water, but there's less gas exchange, and there's an increase of photorespiration. And these plants kind of just deal with the photorespiration. They don't really have a way to protect that rubisco enzyme from unnecessarily mixing with the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. Because in general, a lot of these plants didn't necessarily evolve to deal with these hot, dry conditions. But it is a problem seen in agriculture because an increase of photorespiration can mean a decrease in productivity of the plant because ultimately photosynthesis isn't necessarily happening. But let's move into the plants that have these very interesting adaptations to deal with photorespiration and reduce that overall. So first we have the C4 plants. And C4 plants are known as C4 plants because their first stable carbon fixation product has four carbons. And the reason this is, they still run the Calvin cycle just the same as other plants, but they have the Calvin cycle actually separated from the initial capture of CO2. So in the mesophyll cell, the CO2 will enter and be converted into a four carbon compound that will then be transported into a bundle sheath cell, which is just another type of cell. But that's the cell where they're gonna be running the Calvin cycle. And so since the Calvin cycle needs CO2, the four carbon compound will then be split back into CO2 so that it can then enter the Calvin cycle and the Calvin cycle can run in that bundle sheath cell. And what this does is it helps to protect the rubisco from excess oxygen and helps to protect from the effects of photorespiration. It's important to note that photorespiration will still happen, but not nearly as much. And one example of plants that are C4 plants and do this is sugarcane. So plants that are a little bit more adapted to those more hot, a little more dry environments. This is one way they deal with that is they literally spatially separate where the CO2 comes into the leaf and the oxygen leaves from this Calvin cycle so that the rubisco enzyme can be protected. And the other way that plants deal with this is by temporally separating CO2 capture and the Calvin cycle. And that just means they separate it by the time that it's run. So these are the CAM plants. And like the C4 plants, the first stable carbon fixation product has four carbons. So what happens is at nighttime, the stomata will be opened and the CO2 will come in and be converted to this four carbon compound. And so this also helps the plants kind of 
conserve water because nighttime the temperatures will be cooler and they're able to lose less water while the stomata are open and while the gas exchange is happening. And then during the day, the plant will close their stomata, the four carbon compound will be converted back into CO2 and the Calvin cycle will run. So the Calvin cycle will only really run during the daytime because it needs the products from the light reactions to run, which is one of the reasons why it's no longer called the dark reactions because it doesn't happen in the dark. It can't happen without those light reactions. And so then this is protecting the rubisco from the excess oxygen because that initial carbon fixation is happening at night. Stomata are open at night so the oxygen can get out of the leaf and they can start to build up carbon dioxide so that the Calvin cycle can run during the day and they can also run those light reactions and produce the sugars. One example of a cam plant is the pineapple plant, but you can also think of cam plants as things like succulents and cacti. So these very, very hot, dry condition plants are more likely than not going to be cam plants. So that's basically what happens during photosynthesis. This has been a very general overview, but I have never been in a entry level or heard of an entry level bio class that goes into much more depth than we went here. Now it does get a little more complicated and a little more in depth as you move up into a more advanced biology or a more specialized plant biology class, but this is in general what you're going to need to know. Light is captured in those photosystems. Photosystem two is where the oxygen is produced and then the Calvin cycle produces the sugars because of the carbon fixation. And then knowing the difference between the C3, C4 and CAM plants is important as well. So the way that I usually remember those is C3, there's no separation. It just kind of lets the photorespiration happen. C4, there's a physical separation of the Calvin cycle and the CO2 capture. And then CAM plants, there's a night and day separation of the CO2 and Calvin cycle. But I know this has been a bit of a long one. I know this has been a bit complicated because photosynthesis is complicated because plants are complicated. But I do hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. This has been the end of unit one. So Next up, we're going to be starting to get into a little bit of genetics and things like that, if I am not mistaken. Um, we may or may not be starting chapter eight next week. I haven't decided if I want to put in a break between units, but I know there was a break between um, cellular respiration photosynthesis because of midterms. So we'll see what I decide. But no matter what happens, I will see you all in the next one. Thank you again for watching this video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell if you would like to see more. And if you'd like to follow me on any of my other social medias, the links are down in the description below. Don't forget to check out thereptilegoth.com for all of my articles and blog posts. If you found any value in this video and you would like to help support the channel, please check out my Patreon page. That link is also in the description down below. And a special thanks goes out to my Diamond Dragon patron, Diane V. What you're doing is really helping me fund a dream here. I will see you guys all in the next one.